Well, one of the challenges that have come up, has come up over the last six months have been the new government regulations in China. And China imports roughly 30 percent of the scrap material that the United States generates, or did up through the end of last year. Giving you some idea, uh, uh, certainly on the, and off the West Coast and the various port cities uh, in uh, the Gulf and uh, the eastern U.S., tremendous amounts of cargo would, would ship to China because of the uh, imbalance of uh, freight of incoming goods coming from China would ship back scrap and uh, metals, which account for 50 percent of by volume of the U.S. exports. So beginning the first of this year, China clamped down on the quality restrictions and uh, put some arbitrary uh, measures uh, in that. And, and one of the things that happened was all mixed paper is now banned from China, whether it's from the United States, or the European Union, or anywhere else. Well, that alone was 400,000 tons of material a month that now has nowhere to go. So when you're looking at your curbside recycling and you, you're, you co-mingle your glass with your paper and your plastic, very likely now most of that is going to the dump because there's simply no homes. Um, by the same token, they tightened up the, the uh, restrictions on newsprint and cardboard. And newsprint now, if it has even a scent of garbage, it is prohibited from coming into China. So for instance, last week, which, which the first week of March, which was the first real week of enforcement uh, in China, 23,000 tons of newsprint from the United States was rejected at the ports of Ningbo and Tianjin. Um, there are rumors of large, other large rejections, but these are the ones I'm certain of. Uh, so we're of the opinion that no newsprint that's come from a uh, commingled uh, uh, a, a commingled system where you have the garbage trucks going around picking newspapers at the driveways or whatever, and then uh, they sort out the glass from the plastic and all that. All that stuff's going to the dump because there's just no place for that to go right now, particularly with the glass on it. Um, and then with cardboard, they put in an arbitrary restriction of half of 1% of prohibitives. And that, that means in a 2,000-pound bale, you can have 10 pounds of plastic or anything else, and again, you can't have any scent of garbage on it. So most of the uh, cardboard that's being generated through the uh, garbage companies, through your waste managements or republics or waste connections or whoever your local hauler is, these are being forced to go to other homes other than China, which means all of a sudden you had this pie that had 100% a year ago or, or f three months ago. And today, 30% of that pie is gone, and we're looking for homes for that 30% of the pie, but the other 70% is already full. So what happens is that you're just trying to stuff that other 30% where there's no room. And, you know, it's like Thanksgiving when you've just finished your dinner, you've gorged yourself, and someone comes in with this fabulous pecan pie. Uh, what do I do with it now? Well, you've got to eat it right away because I've got another one coming in about an hour. And that's kind of where this is you know, where they're gorged, so the prices for the mills that can take the less than pristine material that China is demanding have gone way down, and the amount of cargo that really will comply with China's new uh, uh, specifications and their very strict inspection uh, uh, arrangements uh, is, has gotten much smaller. So the, the world for recycling has changed markedly in the past few months. Uh, and all of us who, you know, participate in the curbside programs, you're rolling your, your recyclables to the curb, or if you're an industrial commercial uh, generator um, uh, like a, uh, an Amazon or a Kraft Heinz or uh, 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 an Ikea, that has changed as well. Um, uh, and for, if you're a recycler, as I am, you know, we are the last, if you will, the last uh, of the foot soldiers. We're really on the line and we're being forced to inspect every single bit of material that comes in our facility, and we're being forced, uh, certainly in the West Coast, to see if it's possible to hit these very, very difficult specifications that China's put forth, frankly arbitrary and unnecessary, given the, the sophistication of their, their mills. But I understand their desire. They don't want water pollution any more than you and I want water pollution, and frankly, no one should want water pollution. That's just not something that really is, is, is in our, uh, is certainly in my bandwidth, I'm, I'm fairly intolerant of that. I like swimming in, in a lake that's clean, and I like drinking clean water that isn't going to make me ill. I mean, you know, we don't want any more Flint, Michigans here. 
So, I mean, I can understand the Chinese concern for it, but nonetheless, it's, it's making this extremely difficult in the recycling world uh, and, and impacting everyone both on a price and a labor standpoint. Great. So what does it mean for our customers? How do they have to change their habits or their you know, operations? Or how do we best communicate with them to? Um, the customers have to be extremely careful about what they put in their, their bales or the, their compactors, their balers, the compactors. It really just has to be cardboard or it really just has to be uh, um, uh, a shrink film, a, a clean, clear or colored shrink film, not having any foreign particles like food particles or uh, uh, dust or plastics. Plastic is a really big thing. Uh, these inspectors in China are not very sophisticated. They really don't understand how light plastic is relative to uh, uh, anything else that they've dealt with. And they don't understand that 10 pounds in a 2,000 pound bale is a really voluminous amount of plastic. So we're working very hard to try and get all the plastic out, which is next to impossible. You look at a beverage uh, uh, a can, uh, you look at a soda uh, case that comes in, and uh, you know it tends to have a little bit of plastic of uh, cardboard on the bottom and a plastic overwrap. Well, that plastic overwrap now has to be taken off that little bit of cardboard if you want to recycle it. Otherwise, someone like someone at my plant or me, which is how I spent my morning. Uh, have to take that over wrap off, and we can recycle that as a different grade of plastic, but the, the labor involved is just enormous. But the penalties for not doing it are, are as follow. You can be fined $10,000 a container. You can be blacklisted in China, and your firm and uh, uh, anyone associated with your firm can be prohibited from imp uh, exporting uh, goods to China or if it's consistent, it goes on consistently with the mills, the mills can either be restricted in their operation or in certain cases will be taken over by the government and their leaders put in prison. And these, these are happening, uh, whether uh, this is one of the three goals of the uh, Fifth Party Congress that ended in October, and the three goals were one, reduce pollution, two, reduce debt, and three, reduce poverty. Now, what's made a lot of uh, press in the past uh, month has been HNA and Ann Bang, which were two large Chinese conglomerates. Uh, with, in the case of Ann Bang, the owner of Ann Bang was married to the daughter of Deng Xiaoping. And they were put in prison for too much debt. And their assets were confiscated. So that was number two. Getting rid of pollution was number one. These guys aren't messing around. And if you want to ship to China, you're going to hit these parameters. So it's in everyone's interest to put a little more effort in it, pay a little more attention uh, in an effort so that the goods are recycled. China is a huge market. They really want this material. We assume that they're short, given what's happened, about 20 to 30 percent of the raw material they need. And their option is to buy pulp, which means more trees get, get taken down. And frankly, it's less desirable for them economically. It costs them an extra probably $150 a ton to make paper because the differential uh, cardboard is arbitrarily low right now, that price, and the price of pulp is going to go up again, but even now there's a $150 differential in terms of the value. So they want it, we've just got to put it in a form where we can export it, where they're not going to get in trouble with their government. And remember, their government is, is an autocratic government. They, you know, they don't elect their leaders, really. You know, and this was a country that has done some crazy things in the past 60 years to hit policy. If you think of the Great Leap Forward in which 30 to 50 million people were starved to death, or the Cultural Revolution in the late 60s where you had, you did have some starvation, but you had arbitrary uh, uh, anarchy going on in the country for a couple of years. These guys are not afraid, afraid to enforce tough decisions. They are going to enforce this. It's in everyone's best interest. Our interest as recyclers, our interest as citizens of the planet, and our interest in terms of making this a better place to live, to do this right the first time. That's great. There's one more thought. Okay. You know, if we don't, if we don't ship our cardboard to China, it's going to end up in our landfills because we can't use that much in our own paper mills, and we don't All have right. that everywhere else to sell it. 
Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's, so there's consequences for us as well. Yeah, there's no question there's consequences in, in terms of uh, the material going to the landfill. It's real simple. If uh, uh, we don't sort it, it's going to ultimately go uh, to a paper mill in the United States in some lower quality material, whether it's uh, from San Francisco or from Reno or from Phoenix or from Des Moines or from New York City or Cleveland, Ohio, is going to go to the landfill because it's all one closed uh, universe. There's so much demand universally, and if it can't be satisfied with waste paper, you know, uh, the mills that can take it are full and will continue to be full. And so the option is the ones that want, that need, like China, this higher quality uh, waste paper, they're just going to wipe out more trees in places like uh, Russia or uh, 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 Indonesia where the rainforests go down to create pulp, an unbleached craft pulp, and they'll run it in there. And it's not in the Chinese mill's interest. They want to buy waste paper. They want to buy old cardboard because they'll make more money because they're greedy. And in this case, their being greedy will help us, but we have to help ourselves. We have to sort better. We have to understand that the world is a changing place. We have to understand that, that things we did five years ago or 10 years ago or even two years ago are no longer acceptable. Uh, where, you know, in China and the rivers in Asia, which have put 80 to 90 percent of the plastics in the ocean, they now realize that's a problem and they're starting to address cleaning up those oceans. Uh, we're working with the Ocean Cleanup Group, which is looking at the North Pacific Gyre. Um, no one thought about that five years ago. And now we're thinking about it, and that's a good thing. The bad thing is I'm having to work harder and I'm making less money, and I don't like that. You know, and the same is true with recycling in the United States is we're working harder, we're making less money because of this huge ruction that's being caused by the Chinese government. But we can look at it and, you know, you get a chicken in life and you can either make a ch chicken salad out of it or you can make chicken whatever you want to describe it. And I'm trying to make this into chicken salad and I suggest everyone else hop on that as well.